In his beautiful work, The Book of Awakening, Mark Nepo shares the story of a woman who found a folded sponge, completely dried up and compressed. Tucked inside the hardened folds was a message she had been seeking for a long time. She carried the hardened sponge to the sea and up to her waist in the deep, submerged it in the waves. As she watched it unfold and come to life in the water, suddenly the secrets of life became visible in the bubbles released from the sponge. To her amazement, a small fish trapped in sleep in the hardened sponge came alive and swam out to sea. No matter where the woman went from that day on, she felt the little fish swimming in the deep, and its memory stirred in her a sense of peace, meaning, and joy. Today begins this summer-long unfolding of a new series, Creating a Life of Meaning, Sacred Pathways. And it seems to me that whatever our unique spiritual pathways as individuals and the communal pathway we discern and share together, creating lives of meaning somehow always has to do with the awakening and freeing of what has been asleep. Like that sponge, our hearts beg to unfold in the waters of our experience. And like that little fish, once our souls are set free to swim, we awaken to peace and joy, to meaning masked in mundane moments, and even awaken to the sacred submerged under the surface of the seconds that string together our days. All life is meaningless. That's how the teacher begins the ancient wisdom book of Ecclesiastes. At first glance, we observe a heart compressed by the difficult realities of life. Many a cynic and pessimist have found a kindred spirit in this author. And yet hiding in that word meaningless is a small fish of considerable meaning. The Hebrew word havel, or vapor, or mist, that's the word. All life, the poet says, is vapor. Time fleeting as mist. The English word meaningless doesn't quite capture the nuance of the Hebrew, which might best be rendered precious, sacred. Ecclesiastes belongs to this ancient Jewish wisdom tradition. Its voice unique in that it is wisdom for when conventional wisdom fails, or when A and B don't equal C. Just eat healthy and exercise, and you'll live a long life. But sometimes the fittest suffers an incurable disease. Be a good person, and good will return to you. But often the kindest, most giving among us is taken advantage of most. Put your head down, work hard, and you'll be successful. But sometimes circumstances beyond us don't allow it in the ways we had hoped. Embrace greed as a virtue. Oppress others and you won't last long. Ha, responds Ecclesiastes. Why do those who intentionally choose evil keep on getting their way? Vapor. Nothing new under the sun, and the world turned, turned, turned. And yet there is this marvelous move throughout the author's verses that reaches a climax by chapter 3. There is a time for everything, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest and 11 more descriptive pairings that witness to the rhythms and realities of life's deepest joys and sorrows. Each season of life, the author seems to suggest, may be a sponge that when plunged into the waters reveals the goodness of a gift or perhaps the difficulty of a new lesson. 
there is an undercurrent of wisdom that flows throughout the experience of life that might be tapped. Each moment, a portal through which to make meaning of our circumstances as we grapple with the complex realities of being, including the transient, mist-like nature of it all. The author's hopeful turn in the rest of the book, while life is fleeting, yes, we have life today, so let's truly live. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That's Ecclesiastes. That's in the scriptures. In other words, let joy shake you awake. Baptize your cynicism in the radical amazement that we are here, that we are conscious of our being and can make meaning of it all. That although we are small, we are important, interconnected parts of an unfathomably grand and mysterious cosmos. Wisdom in this ancient tradition is portrayed as the creative life force of the divine. So tapping into wisdom, we might say, is the practice of waking up to God. One of the most important theological statements I ever read was written by Richard Rohr. We cannot attain the presence of God because we're already totally in the presence of God. What's absent is our awareness. Upon hearing that for the first time, I felt like the proverbial fish standing on the beach. You know this fish, yes? Maybe you've been this fish who looks back at the water from which they've just emerged and thinks, huh, I did not know those were the waters in which I was swimming. Well, in fact, I didn't know I was swimming in water at all. It was all air to me. Reminds me of the poet Kabir who once asked, what is God? Then answering his own question said, God is the breath inside the breath. Or like the mystic, Mechthild of Magdeburg, who said, the day of my spiritual awakening was the day I saw and knew I saw all things in God and God in all things. Human beings may separate things into as many piles as we wish, to echo Barbara Brown Taylor, separating spirit from matter, sacred from secular, people from their divine image. But we should not be surprised when God does not recognize these distinctions we make between them. Wisdom challenges and then collapses our dualities once and for all. Wisdom says there are only sacred places and peoples and creatures. And it is our choice whether we honor and treat them as such or dismiss and desecrate them as other. And as I remind myself often, justice and love, these are the imperatives of sacredness. When we practice waking up to God in all people and all nature and all life, we can't help but be moved to protect and defend it at all costs. A time for every purpose under heaven, meaning in every season, if we can tell the time. Sometimes we hold on for dear life to that which is finished, a time to keep or a time to cast away. Sometimes we refuse to let go of a relationship or situationship that has ceased to be nourishing. A time to embrace or a time to refrain from embracing. Sometimes we try to fix when all a friend or partner needs is our presence. A time to speak or a time to keep silent. Then there are times of injustice when silence is violence. A time to keep silence or a time to speak up. How we've always done it isn't working anymore. And we're behind everything and everyone because we refuse to move forward. A time to seek or a time to lose. Sometimes in our grief, doing the hardest thing 
might be the one thing to return us to life. A time to mourn or a time to dance. So what about killing and hatred, hostility and war? Is there a time? What meaning is there in these? I've always been troubled by these parts of the scripture. But I imagine they reveal the poet's refusal to see life through rose-colored glasses. Their realism about the certainties of this world. And perhaps they function just like the others, asking if we are aware of the time. Are, Are we living in ways healing to the world and to us? Do we work for peace in our lives when so many beat the drums of war? Do we insist on love and resist hatred when so many do not? Once the Dalai Lama and an Indian psychoanalyst held a public dialogue on hatred. The latter said that a healthy person should be able to hate all they want and then to transcend hating. The Dalai Lama disagreed, sharing his Buddhist view. And he told the story of a man who had been imprisoned in Tibet and tortured by the Chinese. After he was released, the man told the Dalai Lama that on two occasions, conditions had become critical. Had he been close to death? The Dalai Lama asked. No, the man responded. Twice, I almost hated the Chinese. Wrote Orest Bedrij, to know God without being like God is like trying to swim without entering the water. And I happen to believe that divine love is restless until it turns woundedness into health, all distortion into beauty, and all embarrassment into laughter. What time is it? Wisdom always awaits with an answer when we are awake to it. Perhaps our greatest teacher in the end is that small fish who goes searching for the depths when it has surfaced and goes searching for the surface when it has bottomed out. The ribbon of God's sea passing through its gills at each turn, turn, turn. The small fish takes in water through its gills, which turn it into the air by which it lives. It strikes me that our hearts, minds, spirits, and bodies are like gills too, turning water into air so that we might truly live, turning our experience of life into something that can sustain us and nurture us too, turning pain into wonder and wisdom, heartache into joy and meaning sacred pathways that leave love in their wake. Waking up to the divine, I think, is bringing awareness to a presence, no matter where we are or what we're doing. Being fully alert to whatever or whomever is right in front of us. Being aware of the tremendous gift of being alive or giving ourselves wholly to the moment of here and now looking, anticipating the joy it holds. And these are all prayer. Prayer is happening. It's not necessarily something that we are doing. God is happening like a sacred current flowing. And we are lucky enough to know that we are in the midst. I was moved this week reading the incredible Suleika Jaoud's reflection about her arduous experience with cancer. I'm currently cancer-free, she reflected, but I'll never be considered cured. I'll be in treatment for the rest of my life. In circumstances like mine, people often advise you to live each day as if it's your last. It's the old carpe diem ethos, one that dovetails so neatly with the American idea of striving. Pack in as much as you can. Ring as much as possible from every moment. But it feels so pressurized to think that way. And chaotic, too. 
life. We literally lived each day as if it were our last. We'd all be draining our bank accounts to go on wild bucket list adventures and maybe robbing the bank while we were at it. So rather than living every day as if it's my last, I've shifted to a gentler approach of living every day as if it's my first. I want to wake up and meet the day with the wonder of a newborn, to cultivate childlike qualities like curiosity and play. Creating lives of meaning is always about the awakening and freeing of what has been asleep. Our lives, if we're listening, beg to unfold in the waters of our experience, beg to be set free to brave the sea. So let's lean into this life fully, ceaselessly open in the face of its beauty and its terror, attuned to what time it is and what love has yet to set free. Amen.